Good evening and, uh, and welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us uh, this evening for what I anticipate will be a fascinating and timely discussion. Uh, we're thrilled to have with us tonight Ma Jun, uh, the founding director of the Institute of Public and Environmental Affairs, who's visiting this week uh, with the Chicago Council on Global Affairs as their 2017 uh, Dr. Scholl Foundation Visiting Fellow. Uh, so thank you to the Chicago Council, uh, our partners for helping us uh, make this conversation possible. Uh, interviewing uh, Majun tonight will be EPIC Faculty Director Michael Greenstone, who is the Milton Friedman Professor uh, in Economics, the College, and the Harris School. I also want to take a moment and recognize Ambassador David Rank, who we were uh, so excited to announce today is joining EPIC as a senior fellow after a 27-year career uh, in the Foreign Service. So please just join me in welcoming David as well. Uh, and with that, I want to welcome uh, Bala uh, Srinivasan, who is the Vice President for Global Initiatives and Strategy uh, and Senior Associate Provost here at the University, who will introduce uh, Majin. Thanks, Sam. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Sam said, I'm um, Bala Srinivasan, and I'm, I'm Vice President here at the University. And, um, I'm here to welcome you all here, but most importantly, um, to welcome Mr. Majun here to the university on behalf of the leadership of the university. Um, um, all of you obviously know um, a lot about his legendary work in environmental circles in China. <clears throat> but as I got handed um, the briefing um, to his work and learned a little bit more about it, I was um, struck by some parallels that makes it, I think, um, especially appropriate that he's here um, at Epic at Chicago. The first has to do with the journey that has brought Epic to where it is and the parallel journey um, of Mr. Ma's career. So Mr. Ma was born in Qingdao and started his path to environmentalism through journalism. He worked as an investigative reporter um, in Hong Kong's South China Morning Post from 93 to 2000. Um, eventually he became bureau chief there. And um, he became one of the first Chinese reporters, mainland Chinese reporters, to focus on environmental issues um, as you know, Hong Kong is a particularly good vantage point to look at China and see the uh, rather heavy environmental degradation there. And in 1999, he published a book called China's Water Crisis, um, and um, <clears throat> it, it, it focused uh, public attention on this uh, looming e ecological problem. And at that point, he moved from reporting on environmental problems to, um, to focusing on solving them. Which brings me to the parallel, uh, to the transition uh, that led to the current work of EPIC, which Michael often tells me uh, is driven by a transition from writing research articles in um, dusty journals that no one reads, to doing research and translating it simultaneously to real world impact through strategic outreach with both governments and corporations, and then training the next generation of energy leaders. The next parallel between, um, between here Epic and the University of Chicago and Mr. Ma's work is in making this transition, both us at Epic and Mr. Ma realized that the most important thing in the work is data. Um, in Mr. Ma's case, recognizing that public participation was key to pressuring the government to force uh, enforce environmental regulation, Mr. Ma started working on a database of emission records that aggregated publicly available data to make it more user friendly for citizens. He did in this process, two important institutional things. He launched the China Water and Air Pollution Maps, which became transformative tools in China's burgeoning environmental movement. And he founded the nonprofit uh, Institute for Public and Environmental Affairs in Beijing, which pushed forward those efforts and also developed rankings for cities and regions in China with special focus on the level of environmental information disclosure. Now in 2013, July after that, the Chinese Ministry of Environmental Protection announced that it would require the country's key stra uh, state monitored enterprises to begin disclosing emission levels of common pollutants in real time, allowing the public to access this larger and much richer set of information. Now while this not, might not be a strictly uh, causal thing, um, I've, not, I've often noticed, especially in India and China, that once data begins to be captured and disseminated in some limited way, with some limited circles, the government feels some kind of implicit pressure um, to prevent this limited data availability and then goes ahead and makes data more broadly available. 
Um, so that strategy seems to work often and it worked very well for Mr. Ma's work. So Mr. Ma and the IPE then created a system to aggregate and compare this huge array of information and designed um, the influential smartphone app called Blue Map that allows residents to continuously monitor the environmental conditions in their local areas and across the country, placing the information in the hands of those to whom it matters the most and who are most powerful, namely the residents. In 2006, um, this work <coughs> led to Mr. Ma being recognized um, by Time Magazine as one of the world's 100 most influential people. He was also honored with the Goldman Prize in 2012 for his environmental protection work in China and the 2015 Skoll Foundation Award for Social Entrepreneurship for his innovative approach to lifting the veil on China's pollution problems. With that, I'd like to invite Mr. Ma and, uh, and Michael um, for their conversation on the role of data transparency in the war on pollution. Thanks. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we're honored to have you here today uh, and uh, excited to have you to in Chicago. So I thought maybe first, maybe not everyone has played with your app. Maybe you could tell us uh, a little bit about the blue map uh, and what it is and how it works uh, and kind of this its state of play in China today. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Michael, for inviting me, and thank you, Bala, for the gracious uh, introduction. And I can definitely, I, I thought I can definitely skip any sort of opening remarks because it was such a detailed uh, introduction <laughs> about <laughs> my, uh, you know, experience uh, with this. You know, I, uh, the reason that we uh, focus on, on data transparency is, uh, is because in, in our country, you know, we, uh, now, not just uh, the pollution problem have exposed uh, hundreds of millions to, to health hazards, and, um, uh, but also because when we look into, you know, despite all the efforts made, resources spent to try to solve the problem, uh, we still haven't seen the real turning point yet. Uh, I think much of that has something to do, not just, you know, the, the, the root cause is not just the lack of technology or even money. Uh, we have huge potential for that, but uh, but the uh, I think the lack of uh, motivation is a, is a serious problem. You know, rules and regulations copied from the West, but not uh, enforcement have not quite followed uh, with that. And uh, here, uh, I have some chance to spend some time at uh, in the U.S. in those early days uh, at Yale, really. Uh, benefited uh, through my fellowship there and uh, understand that much of the problem uh, has been resolved through, you know, first legislation and then enforcement and then, you know, the very fact that uh, NGOs and uh, even citizens can go to the court to drive enforcement. You know, in the early days, it's still the business or even some local government may not want to go uh, that far, but uh, but in China the litigation channel, so far you know our judicial system has yet to function like here, so we need to find an alternative way to drive that uh, in, uh, enforcement. And to me, um, I think that can uh, issues environmental challenges of such a magnitude and complexity cannot be resolved without extensive participation. And uh, uh, but we can. Uh, in some way, we got inspired by those uh, pioneering work in the United States on transparency. You know, the uh, the uh, toxic release uh, inventory and uh, many other legislations focused on that. You know, we learned that, and uh, uh, at that time, you know, uh, more than ten years ago, when we tried to get started, uh, China has just leapfrogged into the information age and that also prepared a very important technology uh, for us to, uh, to, to, to try to rely upon this, uh, try to start our transparency work. And so we started with that database and then website uh, uh, and, um, and, and in China, I think, we kind of feel that uh, not only we need to learn from the transparency work here, but we need to uh, 
probably push it to more extreme and even try to adopt some disruptive way of transparency because we don't have other uh, alternatives and uh, so uh, so I think we want to take advantage of the mobile internet uh, whenever it's ready you know we compile the data but at the beginning very limited uh, and uh, and then we started getting more so around the year 2012 we, uh, we when we started seeing the uh, increasing usage of mobile internet uh, we are we were we st we thought about doing some app, you know, just to put our project our pollution map to the to the cell phone. But then we give up that idea because app is something very special, you know. Unless you have a really a day-to-day -day use function, you know, people will not actually uh, have any habit to really use it because it's uh, it's not like if they don't use it, it's not like website. When you try to use, it, then it's there app is something you have to keep it on your cell phone and you uh, otherwise it's simply no use and most people will not keep many apps on their cell phone so so we don't have that opportunity but then 2013 as Bala explained that a group of NGOs including us you know we launched the total transparency initiative calling for the disclosure of the real-time disclosure of the online monitoring data uh, we thought it going to take years before the government uh, says yes, but to our surprise, the ministry came up uh, with a bylaw just uh, four or five months later calling for requiring this to happen from the year 2014. And toward the end of 2013, we started seeing different, you know, platform, provincial platforms being viewed to carry that data. We thought that, it, you know, with real-time data uh, on so many platforms, uh, on computer, on PC, it's still not quite easily accessible. So we can, we need to tap into the mobile internet. This is the time for that. So we started uh, uh, building our, designing and developing our app, uh, and we launched that in uh, in in June 2014, uh, allowing people not just to access the uh, the data on air quality in all the different cities uh, uh, in China started with 74 and now covers the, all the municipalities in China, but also for the first time on water quality, the data on rivers and lakes and now drinking water source. Um, and of course, the special part is uh, the online monitoring for 14,000, uh, some of the largest uh, uh, air and water emitters and sewage plants in China. And uh, what we found is people not just uh, uh, access the data, they share that through social media. It's combined with social media. I think that part is also powerful. And uh, they tag in their official uh, Weibo account when they share the violation records of those uh, uh, companies uh, uh, that we visualize you know, with different color coding uh, based on their level of compliance. Um, and thousands of reporting have been filed against polluting factories, and so far more than 700 of them, uh, with half of them state-owned enterprises, openly you know uh, address their violation problem. They used to be insensitive <coughs> to that, uh, and they decided to to change. And uh, I just want so, so let yeah. me. I just uh, I want to pick up <laughs> one thing you said there. Yeah. So. There's no new rules. There's no new laws. You have created, in, or the map, the app has created information. People take that information, and that leads to change. Yeah, I mentioned the the, the ministry's bylaw yeah. to require this the disclosure. Yeah. yeah, the release of that. But then uh, you're right. There's no new laws, uh, and. Uh, uh, but later on, we, we, of course, we do have the new environmental protection law uh, amended, amended for the first time in 25 years yeah. of time, and uh, dubbed as the most stringent laws in China. Uh, prior to the, uh, the real-time disclosure of that online monitoring data, we have this automatic monitoring for more than 10 years in China. But those data have not really been put into much use despite the fact that we spent 
billions of yuan to install those data because, you know, as I described, the local government tend to protect the, 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 the factories and uh, those are the lot among the largest and they are the darlings to, to, to the officials and to, to the local government. So they are not quite used and uh, not used as the basis for any penalty fines, but that has been changed in recent years. Some new laws and regulations have just been created, local, local ones, uh, and some central government ones, to allow the continuous uh, uh, monitoring as the basis for some penalty fines. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is a good, com com I see a good combination of both the public supervision based on that and also the kind of a strengthening of enforcement. And w why do the polluters pay attention to what the public thinks? Yeah, the... Uh, I've always, I would say that, you know, the U.S. has had this toxics release inventory since the 80s, and that's always been kind of a slightly unanswered question. Uh, suppose you read about a plant that's in your neighborhood and it's emitting lots of pollution, what are you supposed to do about it? Yeah, I, I read, uh, you know, in, in my days at Yale, I read that uh, actually uh, the uh, release of toxic relief, uh, imagery uh, in those first uh, several years got quite much attention. They published the, the kind of a, a top ten one of the most uh, polluting fact uh, companies in China uh, in in the U.S. and some of them got quite some pressure. Like uh, uh, I read Monsanto, you know, the head of Monsanto kind of say that uh, uh, look, wait, you know, we must cut back this uh, uh, toxics uh, released by. He said 90 percent, uh, and uh, I think it, uh, his staff all feel that's crazy. But uh, uh, the res end result is over 95 percent. I think they cut cut back that much, and uh, so those are quite successful. Uh, obviously, they bow to this um, this public pressure, and also the concern over the image uh, tarnish of their image, and maybe their own conscience. Uh, but in China, you know, we also have cases like, uh, you know, I just want to give one example. Uh, uh, Shandong Iron Steel is uh, one of the listed company, one of the largest uh, steel manufacturer in our country. And before we have some records, uh, but limited number of them. When they started their real-time disclosure, uh, Shandong government have done a good job to, uh, to keep the integrity of the data. So we can see that uh, it's uh, uh, always above the standards and sometimes up to 10 times above the sulfur dioxide standards. And uh, so we try to engage them with them as an NGO. And uh, they are listed companies, so we have a public uh, phone number to call them, the secretary of their <laughs> board or something. And, uh, and, and he, uh, basically, they, their response to my colleague is that as a listed company, this is not something that we take as very important, yeah. you know. Uh, so, so obviously, they, they're not very good at PR, but, uh, but that was <laughs> very, very blatant kind of a, a statement. And we, they know we can't do much, you yeah. know. Uh, here, we, in China, we, we don't have some of the tools of NGOs here, so we can't really you know, do very much to them. But then, over and over again, that uh, violation had been spotted by local residents in Jinan and uh, local NGOs there. They started to uh, uh, tweet that, you know, through our own uh, Chinese Weibo, you know, microblog system. <coughs> and uh, uh, until one day, you know, the, it was picked, they tag in the Weibo account of the local environmental agency. Uh, that was also a requirement by the Chinese central government to have all these agencies to uh, create their own social media account, yeah. uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, at the beginning not much information, but later on proved to be still quite useful. So they tagged them in, and then they, one day they just weigh in. We saw that published on the, uh, you know, we saw the tweet, you know, responded to, to that. Uh, the, the regulator responded. Yeah, the regulator responded saying that uh, we checked at this company. It's, uh, uh, yeah, it has this violation and we have required it to, to solve the problem. Responded to one of the huh. uh, micro reporting by, uh, by a, uh, a local resident. Uh, so, so, and then several months later, 
uh, toward the end of that year, we got another, uh, you know, because during the process more uh, c uh, complaints have been filed and uh, uh, we got an, another response from the follow-up tweet from the agency saying that uh, uh, the company decided to shut down three pellet uh, furnaces, mm. Mm. three production lines. Uh, our guess is because it's highly inefficient. Uh, if you try to factor in the uh, pollution control yeah. cost, you know, you know the profit margin for our steel manufacturing industry in China has dropped to, they said, like, you know, as cheap as white gar cabbage, uh, <laughs> meaning it's dirt cheap, and so, so they won't make any money, so they give it up and, um, and then uh, publish, when they publish this, they tag in our, you know, Weibo account in some way, you know, to respond to the, to the Blue Map app. Mm -hmm. And uh, also they give the, uh, uh, their, their own set of data about the reduction, 2,600 tons of uh, sulfur mm. uh, dioxide every year and 405 tons of, of uh, uh, particulates. Mm. 400 and I don't know how many zeros you <laughs> got to put when you translate that into uh, micro, convert that into yeah, micro micrograms, and meter, uh, yeah. it's just uh, I don't know how much the, each one of the residents going to share, you know, on this, but it's a, a huge uh, reduction, and just with that, uh, that so, one so let one me, uh, there's yeah. one thing that I've been especially interested in uh, your history, and I'm going to, I want to. We're going to go further back in time in a couple minutes, but mm -hmm. uh, you started IPE in 2006, uh, and I think uh, maybe if you if you even went back uh, to 2013 or 2012, you couldn't have imagined uh, the way in which environmental qualities kind of moved into the center of people's attention in China. At least that's my observation from afar. Uh, yeah, the premier has declared a war on it. But you had a long run there, say from 2006, let's say, to, I don't know, to 2014, yeah. uh, where it didn't look like it was going to grab people's attention. And why did you think, uh, you know, this is the thing I should keep doing? And uh, how did you have confidence that it was going to work out? And, you know, part of the reason I ask is uh, there are similar, I think there's parallels to in India right now, what's going on there's with the. Uh, accepting PM as a major problem there. Right. I think it, isn't, it hasn't quite happened in the way it's happened in China. And then I don't, you know, I don't want to exclude the United States. We have our own issues with CO2 and uh, recognizing vast segments of our country have a hard time recognizing that CO2 is a problem. So you were in that same position. And what made you think, you know, I'm going to keep doing this. I think this could go somewhere. Yeah. Uh, first, I have to say I'm really inspired, uh, you know, uh, by the by the great work you and uh, Anand's doing uh, in India. I think it's uh, uh, really, really uh, inspiring and uh, innovative. Uh, the uh, I, I think to us, you know, in those early days, uh, it was uh, not easy because uh, uh, when we got started in 2006, I think transparency and participation, all these are not quite, uh, you know, a lot less kind of recognized and uh, not part of the DNA of our culture and uh, so... And uh, there were probably some people who didn't like the transparency. Yeah, there are those who, and when we put so many of them on our list, yeah. some people dub that as a blacklist. You yeah. can imagine, you know, that not just when we uh, offended those interests and uh, so a lot quite uh, there are, there are quite some pressure but but I think you know even the pressure is uh, uh, to us it's also uh, you know something quite important that, uh, because it's uh, you know at least you got feedback I think that's very important when you try to test run something you you know you you need some feedback you know mm -hmm. and then to give you some confidence that this really touch upon some of the key issues and uh, maybe you know, uh, it's the le uh, right leverage. You know, we have the, uh, uh, you know, we launched our uh, website in, in June, in, in September 2006. Uh, 
you know, the, far, the first uh, nine months, you know, my colleagues almost like totally lost confidence in, in, in our work in, uh, because we continue to grab, uh, compile all this data and uh, uh, filling uh, one spreadsheet after another and uh, before we, uh, our, our uh, website systems ready to launch. And they, you know, they don't see much uh, happening at all. So uh, we're almost That's like, like my academic papers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, but then you know, in November we got the first uh, major company uh, coming to us, saying that uh, the boss read the read read the newspaper in Hong Kong uh, uh, in his breakfast and uh, suddenly read that his company mentioned as a. Mm as a bad polluter and he got really mad with that and uh, take away the year-end bonus of all the senior management in China and uh, decided and required them to solve the problem. So, so they approached us, uh, uh, first sent a, a PR uh, man, uh, VP and, uh, uh, and then understand it's not about PR and uh, we, it's about wastewater violations and, uh, and then second time he they bring the uh, the the, the uh, EHS manager, so we run through that, uh, review that, and eventually they solve that uh, with water. Not just solve the with water problem, they also uh, install that uh, system to try to uh, recycle the the with water. And uh, so so we had the first uh, uh, success. That's really important to to our organization because the Steps started seeing the, uh, the the possibility, the power of uh, of transparency, and from there, one by one, you know, first group are those multinational companies who have their factories, who trans, who who sent their fac build their factories directly in China. They are the global 500, mm -hmm. many of them. So they are the first group that made response. Uh, but to us, that's not enough because it, we all know it's not just the multinational companies. A lot of local companies and uh, uh, the Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan companies, Korean companies, they are not sensitive to, mm -hmm. to this way of uh, public, uh, uh, you know, the so-called name and shame. And uh, they don't care about this. Uh, uh, so we need to engage them in a different way. So we need to find the leverage. So the first leverage we found is the supply chain. We decided that uh, we can't engage directly with those factories, local factories, but we can go through the buyers because they are sensitive. They are facing a different audience, uh, like you know those American companies, uh, European and Japanese. They have their home audience. They made high commitment to very high standards, and uh, uh, but our findings, our records will show very clearly they fail their commitment to the public, to the consumers. So we decided to use that to engage with them and, uh, uh, and then each one of them uh, have uh, hundreds, sometimes thousands or tens of thousands of suppliers in China. So that proved not just become a leveraging force but also more efficient way yeah. to engage. So the point here is that I guess to find the uh, find the find, find the point to try to leverage from there. Yeah. yeah. And was there uh, was there a moment when you thought, you know, maybe this was the wrong thing to be spending my time doing? <laughs> yeah, there are those moments. There are. And, and so, what do you say to yourself then? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. You you probably know that uh, I just like others. I kind of think that if we know uh, earlier, you know, at the beginning, yeah. maybe I could choose another way, <laughs> and, you know. Uh, but, uh, but I've already chosen that way, so we have to stick to it. And uh, there were those uh, moments which uh, uh, we feel, I mean, those early time, uh, particularly difficult, and uh, those uh, uh, companies uh, coming to us very unhappy and, uh, uh, sometimes pretty mad, and uh, so that's uh, yeah. that's a that's easy job because they still come to us. But those who won't come to us, they come to their contact. They come to their yeah. uh, they they report to the to the to the high 
officials. And uh, so those pressure bearing down on us is uh, much tougher. And uh, sometimes at certain moment, we're not sure whether we can continue our work. But, uh, uh, but luckily, some of the decisions made helped us, uh, you know, uh, like the decision to use uh, government monitoring data as the foundation of our database. Uh, that proved to be helpful because data can be very sensitive in our country. And uh, uh, this free us from all these uh, questions about the capacity, the, uh, you know, the, the legitimacy of our, our organization. So, it, so when they come to pressure us, it's not, they realize it's not us, but the uh, government uh, put them on the, on, uh, on the polluters list. It's not us. And uh, we just compile all this scattering data together. You know, today, uh, we're still continuing to do that. One thousand, you know, every day where our, 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 our steps and uh, through the help of computer programming, uh, tracking uh, nearly 1,800 sources uh, from various government agencies. They publish the data but not compile them together. So we serve as uh, some sort of a clearing house uh, for that. Okay, and I, I want to come back to uh, data and data quality in a minute, but uh, I, I'm a little worried I'll, I'll lose a chance to ask this if I don't ask it now. So we have a lot of students here, uh, and they're probably, a lot of them are trying to figure out what they're going to do with their lives, and you created an <laughs> app, and in many American universities, there's no greater thing you could do than create an app. <laughs> uh, certainly Stanford. <laughs> uh, but I thought it was worth stepping back a little bit. Uh, and uh, I noticed you were born in 1968, so was yeah. I. Uh, I went uh -huh. and looked. Uh, China's GDP per capita in 1968 was $100 per person. Uh, today, or in 1970, or sorry, 1990, it was $320 per person. Uh, and today, it's $8,000 per person. It right. has to be, you know, perhaps the greatest feat in human civilization. It uh, is. Pulling yeah. hundreds of millions of people out of uh, poverty, uh, altering lives in, you know, uh, uncountable ways. Uh, but let's go back to 1968 and, you know, you were a boy then. Mm. Uh, did you think you would be here? You know, what were you interested in? What was, you know, the path that led to this? And, I, you know, just to open the discussion, I'll tell you, you know, I spent the first 20 years of my life thinking that I was going to be a professional basketball player against <laughs> all evidence to the contrary. But, uh, you know, what, how did you get here? Yeah. Uh, great question, and uh, uh, yeah, and, 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 and while this massive change was happening yeah, in the I, background, and you know, your country was like undergoing changes that no country had ever seen in such yeah. a short period of time. When I look back, in some way, I think I, uh, uh, you know, we uh, we had our tough time. Uh, you know, the first uh, uh, several years of my uh, my my childhood, uh, we're, we're still in the Cultural Revolution. And uh, uh, parents still sent to the, uh, the, the schools in the you know, uh, countryside, you know, the, when we were quite young. And uh, so it's, uh, 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 it, that was the time of uh, really want of all the kind of a material uh, uh, supplies. And so it's, uh, we have been through some tough time, but, uh, but when I hindsight, I also feel quite uh, uh, lucky because uh, we are the first, almost like the first generation that can enjoy the uh, normal kind of schooling, you know, education and, uh, uh, you know, our, our education has not been disrupted like the brothers, the elder brothers, uh, you know, who have, who need to go to the countryside. And, uh, and in those early days, uh, we did have a lot of blue skies in, mm -hmm. Uh, in Beijing, and uh, uh, a lot more, uh, you know, I learned to swim in the in the local uh, canal, uh, a small waterway in the in the city, uh, and um, I enjoy all the, uh, you know, uh, in those summertime night, you know, a lot of bugs and uh, uh, insects. I love them, and uh, I guess those are the uh, subconsciously, you know, something that. Uh, make me uh, grow up, you know, uh, to have some uh, 
uh, uh, some, some, you know, passion about the uh, nature. But you know, I'm a, I'm a city boy. You know, quite, uh, quite. Those are quite limited. Uh, it was the 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 time when I got chance to travel in different parts of China. I really got struck by the environmental, by the. Uh, environmental damage, especially the the impact on the water. So this is when you were a journalist. Yeah, or? that yeah. was the when I worked for the for the media in the nineteen nineties. So uh, was there an environment beat in the I mean in the nineteen nineties? That must have, you must have been a pioneer in that sense. Uh, environment yeah nineteen nineties. I I I thought I you know I'm I'm quite privileged because at that time uh, the uh, uh, you know. It's not like now people, everyone can travel that, yeah. uh, that much. And uh, our job took us to different parts. And uh, yeah. in the north, I saw all these rivers dried up, including the Mother River, you know, Yellow River. Mm -hmm. uh, more than 200 days a year cannot end up into the sea. And, uh, and then uh, in the south, you know, many, a uh, lot more water, but quite a lot of contamination and uh, eco degradation in the west. So. Uh, I decided to put put into the book because you know when we grow up, we grow up by reading the 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 the, the, the writings of our great uh, uh, poets and uh, um, and and uh, and scholars and uh, uh, but the you know they tend to write a lot about the uh, mountains and hills and the rivers how beautiful they are uh, so uh, so I got something. Uh, a virtual uh, uh, landscape in my mind, but when I really got chance to uh, to 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 be with uh, to see them, they they look so different. Uh, so many barren hills and uh, dwindling of our uh, our wetlands being reclaimed for farming and hillside farm cut all these trees and uh, uh, the grassland degraded, uh, desertified. So. So those are those struck me. Of course, the suffering of the people, and, uh, uh, and so I put it in the in the books, uh, thinking that I have done my duty and I could return to my normal life. But then, uh, it's uh, the readers, you know, com keep coming back, and um, uh, uh, they so kind what, of feel so that. So, what was your? Uh, you wrote the book in 1999. Uh, yes. In, for. Not everyone who's read it, it's widely considered like Rachel Carson's uh, Silent Spring in the U.S. is kind of setting off an environmental movement. You wrote the book. What did you think it would do? It would shine a picture? And could you, in your mind, connect that to policy change? Or just at this point, it was just conveying information? I thought first, you know, I, I, I got a chance to access this, to, uh, to encounter or witness this. And uh, as, as someone who worked for the media, you got a chance to interview. You, yeah. You, those are also very special. So I, I think I, I, I'm privileged to understand some of this, you know, uh, as an outsider. Uh, and so I decided. An outsider, in the sense that you were from the city and these were rural areas. No, I'm outsider of those, uh, you know, because much of that is about very hydrological type okay. of uh, yeah. uh, word. So it's a very, very uh, uh, close circle. So I. I decided that uh, because you know I wrote in the book that when I interviewed the chief engineer uh, of the commission, and they they said some quite some of the engineers would think that uh, you know the uh, dry up of the of the river of the Yellow River only shows the uh, kind of sufficient the 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 rivers put into full use basically you know because it's uh, we are not wasting a drop in the sea. Uh, <laughs> So that's Indeed. not something <laughs> yeah. I quite uh, uh, kind of, as an outsider, kind of uh, are uh, willing to, uh, to, to take. I, I think that it has other functions. Yeah. And uh, uh, you know, our, uh, our, our children, you know, I hope can continue to, 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 to enjoy that. And so, we, uh, so I put that um, uh, in, into the book, thought so that I'm going to, you know, it's too heavy a burden, basically. You yeah. know, I, I laid that and I could do my normal job. And uh, of course, in that, I write about some of the suggestions. But still, it's more about the findings, identifying the problems. Mm -hmm. uh, but then peop when people keep coming back, you know, you understand journalists, you know, we're, we're good at 
finding problems, but not you know creating solutions. It's not something we tend to do, you know, in our uh, reporting. You know, you 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 should be independent. Uh, third part, you know, you need to uh, observe, uh, report what others are doing. So uh, I decided uh, uh, to uh, left and to join the consulting firm, you know, got myself familiar with uh, uh, some of the very important uh, uh, toolkits, like the, uh, uh, those environmental uh, laws and regulations in China, and then the EHS management system. And our our consulting firm is also the f one of the first to help major uh, corporations to create the first uh, set of uh, EHS management uh, tools for the supply chain uh, management. Um, most of them at that time focused very much on the labor side, mm -hmm. but we extended that to occupational health and safety and especially to the environment side because we specialize in the environment, so we created so we use that to test uh, uh, run, uh, you know, in the uh, our our rules in the in those factories. I found that, uh, to my surprise, that it actually can be more effective than even some of the uh, government uh, regulations. Because, uh, you know, whenever the the buyers say that uh, I want this but not that, then they can change a lot, you know. Uh, we literally, you know, several months later, when we go back to some factories, they, uh, we see those uh, female workers, you know, in front of the uh, kitchen, you know, they, they have the blackboard uh, uh, showing, the, you know, kind of almost like your human rights uh, and uh, your, all, the, all the rights of the workers. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in certain workshops, so we, when we uh, noted that they don't have put goggles and so that there's so, mu so much eye injuries and I, th I saw them just to the next time when visit they all have that beautiful goggle and uh, so it just happened. Hmm. So later on I think all this are very helpful you know for us to realize that we can work with the, with the business. The business can be part of the problem if they don't have uh, those uh, uh, environmental policy in their sourcing practice, then they just buy from the cheapest. They actually taking the advantage of the loopholes in countries like China and other developing countries of those weak enforcement to maximize their own gains. So they're part of the problem. They they drive the further drive the suppliers to race down to the bottom to win their contract. But when they change that. Uh, they could become part of the solutions. So they have massive uh, power. But, uh, but when we engage with the companies, they, they have a good excuse. In China, I don't know who are polluting, who are not. So I just can only buy from the cheapest. So, uh, but then, you know, in the year 2007, 8, 9, I could tell them uh, we happen to have some data. We measure, yeah. Yeah, we happen to have... Uh, compiled all this list of violators uh, started from less than 2000 in, in 2006 and then all of a sudden you know to 20,000 in 2008 and today we have more than half a million of them in our database so they can easily compare their list of suppliers with our list of violators and uh, identify the very obvious uh, outrageous violators of rules and standards and um, I'm very glad that an uh, increasing number of them started doing that. So I, I, uh, I think what I, this, I've seen this in my own work in India, and I've seen this in the U.S., and uh, I, I suspect this might be an issue in China as well. And it all goes back, uh, when I was a child, my grandfather was like the best storyteller in the whole family. Uh, and one could never really tell what was true and what wasn't true. Mm -hmm. And so eventually we had to create a system, uh, we asked, you know, is that story true or is it really true? <laughs> uh, and so it seems like the next evolution of these transparency initiatives is making sure that the information that's being fed into them uh, is as reliable, is really true, I guess. Yeah, I think that's a great point. You know, people always say, okay, you take all, you created this, uh, this uh, blacklist, you know, you always take this, you started with all these uh, records of violations. Why don't you take those, uh, uh, you know, the, the top, you know, the good list? Why do, why do you put 
those side by side, you know, we did start only with those uh, battles because the r very reason that uh, uh, because of the protection given to the polluting factories uh, in many regions, we can't quite trust uh, what put on a good list. Yeah. But uh, when they say certain companies are bad, and in reality they could be worse. So uh, in most cases, so I can trust that. But of course, we give them the chance to defend themselves. It's not like we're gonna just uh, take all this uh, 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 as, a, as a giving. And uh, uh, we created a, a path towards solution. The first uh, step is to give them the chance to publish whatever they want, a, st a, st a statement, whatever they want to say. Before you go on the web? Before no, they're no, after. after they yeah. The point is that they have been listed uh, openly yeah. as a polluting factory. So they owe the public some sort of uh, open explanation. Uh, and of course, if something goes wrong, then they also can make their self-defense. Yeah. And so uh, uh, we have a system to, uh, to, to audit that and to verify that and give them the chance to correct that. Uh, but in most cases, and so far thousands of them have come to us and uh, not many cases that they actually in most cases, they still choose to explain what went wrong, mm -hmm. how they try to fix uh, their problem. And uh, so data quality uh, remains to be an issue, especially when we move to real-time monitoring. In certain provinces, I mentioned about Shandong as a, as a champion, as a good example, and Zhejiang is also quite good. Beijing is very, very, you know, tried, tried hard to maintain uh, uh, the quality of the data. But we also have provinces, you know, which are not doing a good job, and uh, uh, they, uh, they, they, they have too perfect a kind of a data, uh, despite the fact that they have very serious uh, air uh, and water pollution. So we can't really quite trust that. And we call that true in my family. Yeah, true. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we take that as a true, and uh, and then. Uh, with that, you know, uh, we are trying our way to try to help identify the, the problem because we have both the uh, automatic monitoring and manual monitoring data. We match them. Sometimes they just don't match at all. Yeah. You know, 24 hours, you know, every hour we can, or every two hours we have the data, but uh, uh, then we can tell that uh, that manual uh, is uh, kind of way beyond the yeah. uh, standard, but then automatic is way below. So then we report those cases, and in quite several uh, uh, occasions, we got the local um, agencies responded, uh, uh, saying they uh, they check it, they penalize those companies, uh, and uh, uh, and then we also, you know, every year on year, send our uh, uh, you know the file this uh, to uh, suggestions to the to the ministry and uh, through the also through the uh, uh, you know motions sent to during the Congress so to our great um, uh, encouragement uh, uh, last month uh, the uh, uh, Central Party Commission uh, along with the State Council issued a joint opinion document uh, for the first time, focus very specifically on the integrity of the data issue, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, criminalize the those uh, false, uh, those who falsify the data, and give NGOs like us, uh, for the first time, the uh, status to file public interest litigation against mm -hmm. third party uh, service providers who for the measurement yeah who uh, yeah for the measurement. Yeah. Uh, uh, or for maintaining, calibrating those yeah. uh, 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 detect uh, those uh, sensors, and for uh, you know if they falsify, uh, they they could be you know subject to this public interest litigation. And I assure you, not you know quite a number of them are having problems. And uh, so we maintain uh, we we already have to build a, a, a special section for uh, third parties. Uh, you know, uh, service providers uh, uh, on our polluters list. So the list is keep growing. Okay, uh, I think I will get in trouble if I don't let other people ask questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted to open the floor to questions here, and uh, well, right away we have one in the back. Yeah. Um, hi, my name so, is Coco. I'm a yeah. thank you. 
Hi, my name is Coco. Thank you for coming here today. Uh, I'm a first year master's student in Harris School of Public Policy. Um, I'm from Hong Kong, by the way. Uh, I saw you work in SDMP for a while. Um, my question would be, how would you comment on the differences between Chinese and US NGOs? Because you were talking about how Chinese NGOs have like limitations locally. And so would you comment more on that? Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. I think we learned so much from the, uh, uh, the, all these uh, NGOs' uh, 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 work in other parts of the world, uh, especially from the uh, work in the United States. And so we have some very close partners uh, here in, in the U.S. And, uh, and we, uh, you know, some of them are sitting there, uh, Linda Greer and the, her colleagues from NRDC, you know, those are very, very close partners. And uh, they have uh, uh, so much uh, experience uh, by, with their campaigning work uh, in the U.S. and uh, try to tackle the, uh, the, 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 uh, those, uh, those uh, problems from very early days. You know, when, when I got my chance to study at Yale and uh, uh, Gus Beth, uh, I think, is also one of the funders of, uh, founders of uh, NRDC. Yeah. Uh, serve as the dean of uh, the environmental school at Yale, and uh, I ended up, you know, uh, hugely benefited from all this, uh, uh, all the, ex all the experience, all this uh, uh, best practice that they have, they have done, and uh, uh, so together we, uh, we become more powerful to try to engage with companies, and uh, uh, in those early days, uh, with uh, uh, one case is Apple, you know, uh, Linda. And I, we ended up, uh, you know, after publishing two reports uh, uh, on their uh, on on the on the supply chain uh, challenges, and uh, we uh, in a after a year and a half, we we got the first meeting, yeah, uh, in their head of headquarter, Cupertino. You know, we spent five hours together with them, you know, reviewing, going through some of the details, and uh, uh, so I think very helpful for us to uh, try to work together because you know not just with all the other you know very very important uh, 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 ca capacity and uh, knowledge and all of this uh, and campaigning uh, uh, skills and uh, more, more than that it's also about the very fact that uh, uh, environmental NGOs started uh, from much uh, uh, later and uh, were much younger and uh, uh, less uh, resources and uh, less known basically you know when we try to engage with uh, 29 IT brands in 2010 uh, many of them uh, only eight of them responded to us mm -hmm. uh, in the first round and uh, later on when more of them are coming they simply say you know when they receive a letter from from a group of Chinese NGOs, they got really confused, uh, uh, con thinking that whether uh, are there real NGOs in in China? I mean, who are these people? I mean, are they try to what's the, what's their motives? But uh, even the the rather small and our small NGO partners in America, they send a letter. They just instantly, often they got response. So. So I think this collaboration is very helpful. And today, it's even more so because we're in a globalized world, like it or not. You know, investment, trade, and uh, all this manufacturing are going global. So we have environmental monitoring have to also go global. And uh, so uh, we can't do it only by ourselves. We need to work together on that. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I was just wondering, I know that um, two of your fellow Goldman Prize winners uh, for, for environmental activism have been assassinated um, just earlier this year and, and last year, Berta Cáceres in Honduras. Um, so I was just wondering if safety has ever been a concern for you and what, if any, protection measures have you taken? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, uh, I really admire, you know, those uh, fellow uh, Goldman Prize winners and uh, uh, feel really, really uh, sad to when something like that happened. Uh, 
uh, to them and to, uh, uh, as a you know Goldman uh, family we all share that uh, you know uh, really feel feel sorrow and uh, uh, back home uh, you know choosing to to do something like this uh, uh, at the beginning was uh, the decision was not easy and uh, uh, I think I feel most uh, sorry for uh, all this uh, uh, you know uh, extra type of uh, uh, anxieties and concerns I put on my uh, family and uh, especially my parents you know to have them worrying about me uh, when when I grow you know already so old and they still worry about me and uh, to make them worry that that's not you know in China it's not filial piety you know it's uh, it's not a good thing to do and uh, 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 so so those are the uh, I do kind of feel that uh, especially in those early days uh, recent years it's getting much better uh, but I would say you know the way that we choose to work. Uh, it's um, partially it's our cultural tradition, partially it's uh, also about our, our national condition. It's not as confrontational. Uh, you know, people sometimes call me a fighter, but you can see I'm I, you know, not quite like that. Uh, so I hope that we can still find a way. Uh, because I, I think there's a way for us to to do it right, you know, I don't take those even the worst polluters as, uh, you know, I don't take the, that as a kind of a they have a moral uh, sort of sin or something. It's more I take more as a, uh, that as a as a gap in our mechanism in our management, you know, which continue the market continue to to reward those who pollute. You know, how can we win this war against pollution if we continue to allow that? So. To set that right is uh, is more important, and um, I think leveling the playing field uh, uh, is uh, eventually going to benefit uh, uh, everyone, and uh, including most of the business people. They actually, the entrepreneurs, they want to, you know, they also want clean air and clean water. They are family; they all live there, and uh, uh, but. Uh, but they got stuck there. You know, I have suppliers coming to me saying that uh, if I treat my waste but not my neighbor, then I lose my business because the buyers will, will, will run away from me. And uh, so that's why we continue to engage with those major brands. And uh, in one case, uh, recent case, we have uh, one company which after you know, a long time of this uh, kind of uh, debate and discussion with, with us, finally decided to change, spent quite uh, decent money to fix their wastewater problem. It's a dye house, one of the largest dye houses in China, suppliers to many major brands. And then the reason they change is because first it's Gap, and then H&M, and then Uniqlo, Marks and Spencer. Finally, Walmart uh, put the final kind of uh, pressure one by one. The first one, maybe it's just 10% of the portion, and then gradually it's the whole business you know if they don't change then they lose their business uh, so the owner actually told me he's uh, quite eventually he said he's happy because it it means that the rule of the game has changed and uh, he has chance to maybe be more sort of competitive to, by spending that 200 million yuan um, so it means every day 40,000 tons of uh, textile wastewater so that's about more than some 12 million tons every year uh, up to the standards discharged into the Chentang River. So I think it's, uh, you know, it just shows that uh, uh, it, it can work. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm Gabrielle. I'm a third year undergrad student from Hong Kong. Um, so I was wondering, um, since the priority is definitely for preventive measures, as um, you've talked about how um, you raise awareness in this issue by, by providing data transparency. So I would like to ask, um, what do you think about the remedy measures since air was already polluted in, in, um, in China, like in this picture, um, the, there's a lot of smog in Beijing. So I was wondering, uh, what do you see are the potential, for example, air purification or 
uh, water quality, um, like cl uh, cleaning the water, that kind of things. Yeah, Thanks. thank you. Yeah, I think you, you should go to, uh, I, I hope uh, Professor Ito, right, uh, yeah, could publish uh, his papers. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I think that paper we, we learned uh, this afternoon is very much what, uh, what, what we also are got feeling in China, you know, people, uh, it, it makes a lot more sense to try to control that from the uh, sources than when you release all this, uh, uh, all this pollution and then try to have everyone to uh, try to purify that uh, 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 personally or household, every household to do that. It's much less efficient. And some of the pollution, if you discharge toxics and metals, into the soil and aquifer are going to take a lot more money even and you can't easily even clean that. Air is actually the easiest. You know, if you stop from the sources then with the wind coming you got blue sky, you know, suddenly coming back and uh, uh, but of course the, the, the tricky part for air is, uh, is mostly about China's energy structure. You know, uh, Michael mentioned about this, uh, uh, you know, China's vast uh, uh, development and uh, great uh, success to pull hundreds of millions out of poverty, and uh, our country's getting, uh, people's getting uh, increasingly better off. But in the meantime, you know, that's much of that is based on a very sharp increase of uh, energy consumption, and uh, uh, year 2000 to 2011. Uh, uh, our co-consumption tripled, and um, you know, I think that's the big picture, basically, behind the uh, very you know local pollution problem, a smog problem, and also you know uh, make China the largest uh, current uh, carbon emitter in the world. So we we have to change that. And um, Copenhagen, we got stuck there. Uh, the, this idea that it's our turn to develop. It's the right to develop, uh, so we can't, you know, we have that uh, uh, argument with the, with the U.S. And, uh, and then 2011, a uh, long stretch of smoggy days in Beijing have uh, made people started uh, requiring, I mean, asking uh, about this, uh, uh, this data. And uh, uh, eventually, the, uh, so much uh, voice have been made all over the Internet and uh, social media. Uh, and the government decided to make that, uh, uh, to, to start uh, disclosing, uh, monitoring and disclosing PM 2.5. Uh, that becomes some sort of a game changer because 2013, when that started happening, uh, that year was very bad. You know, January, many smoggy days, very uh, bad. And uh, people are not satisfied just to learn which day to put on face mask or lock children indoor, they want solutions. So the government came up with the, the first 10 point action plan, which the war against pollution from there, and um, factor in some of the toughest policy choices. First one is curbing the coal consumption. And then to do that, we also need to restructure the industry, which is over dependent on the intensive, energy intensive industries. And uh, all those are very, very tough, but uh, the public support helped the, help, uh, the country, you know, overcome that, uh, that, that barrier. And uh, when that is open, then, you know, suddenly we, along, of course, with the economic, some economic downturn, our co-consumption from that year stagnated and flattened and started declining in slightly in recent years. Not enough. We need to do more. but. Uh, we can see this, this trend of exponential increase have been stopped. This is very important because the original projection by those experts um, is uh, for that number to be, volume to be doubled uh, before we pick in 2040. Uh, we can't sustain that. Uh, the world cannot sustain that. So, so I think this is uh, very important for people to be informed and to weigh in, and it's also helped the government to make the right decision. We started with wa uh, air and water and soil going to take longer time. Yeah. Can, I, can I just pick up on one thing you talked about with coal? It, it's yeah. a, uh, 
It's a complicated issue in the U.S. There's a presidential campaign was at least partially waged on the idea of a war on coal. Uh, and what it revealed, at least in the U.S., was there's lots of distributional concerns. Uh, mm -hmm. There's the people whose livelihoods are directly tied to either coal production or in an industry that is a heavy uh, user of coal. Yeah. And then you have, let's call them other people, urban elites or someone who think coal's terrible and cause air pollution, cause CO2. Do, there are those same political divisions within China or? Yeah, they are definitely. Uh, you know, for, uh, for, for those who uh, need to rely upon, you know, in the cities we have central heating system, although not quite efficient, but still much better than the, the coal stoves and yeah. used by, the, by those country, uh, uh, people in the countryside. And uh, now the government want them to switch to natural gas or electricity to yeah. give up. This year, three million households need to switch, make that switch. Three million households. Three million, yeah, yeah just in the area surrounding Beijing. Uh, lot and so what is, in, can they, three million households be connected to the grid or they can yeah. be? Par partially quickly? great and partially it's uh, the, the gas uh, yeah. powered gas the, yeah, heater and uh, those are very expensive and the uh, government give a lot of subsidy and people also need to pay something. And then uh, the, uh, of course we all take, you know, the very fact that there's too, too much manufacturing going, production going on around, uh, you know, in, uh, the, in the area surrounding Beijing. Just one one example, you know, I just saw the, re the, the most recent uh, data showing, you know, the city of Tangshan uh, uh, in the nearby to Beijing. Uh, it's, it's still, uh, still manufacturing output is slightly larger than the output of the United States yeah. put together, you know, just one city. And, uh, uh, and that's the, uh, you know, Obviously, it doesn't make sense uh, 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 too much of this uh, industry is being attracted to China. Partially, it's our competitive advantage. Partially, it's the lower environmental standards. So we need to, you know, that part is not reasonable. We need to strengthen our enforcement and uh, try to uh, change that. Uh, so, but of obviously, there will be uh, some social impact. Yeah. The workers have been, are laid are being laid off. And are, are there redistribution programs to ease that transition for them? Or that's a thing we often we talk about in the United States. Well, we could compensate them, uh, so that's good enough. And then we often don't end up compensating them. Yeah. <laughs> you, you're absolutely right. Now, compensation is being made, but mostly only to the state-owned enterprises, yeah. laid off workers for the privately owned. No compensation. Yeah. They have just got a notice. They uh, saying that they need to spend some time at home, and then after several months, they understand they better find another job. The jobs won't come back to them. Uh, so this uh, social impact, the social pains are there. And uh, I think, you know, to me, our suggestion, uh, we made suggestion that the best way to use all this uh, uh, trillions of yuan, you know, being multi-trillion uh, yuan budget, the best way to use that is to use that to cushion the impact yeah. rather than helping those dirty factories to retrofit, to, 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 to build those. Uh, 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 those should be more market-based. You know, whoever can do that, then you have the rights to, to compete. Otherwise, you should be out of the game. And, to, and then the, 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 the compensation should be made to the uh, to the workers, I think, to cushion that social impact, to help them to get training and find other jobs. That run. Otherwise, it, it's not, you know, you simply have too big a capacity. You know, our, we got two-thirds of the global iron, iron steel capacity in our country. That's way too big, and we have to change that. Okay, I think we have time for one final question. Well, I guess that's going to be me. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm wondering, as per capita incomes in, in China rise and uh, Chinese consumers have additional options in their choices for what they eat, how they move around, what sort of appliances they buy, what is the role for data transparency and apps in tackling the demand side of emissions in China? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, uh, I think eventually, you know, we need to all, uh, we need to 
recreate uh, the, uh, the accountability system. You know, the government need to be held accountable and uh, the, the brands, we should try to hold them accountable. And uh, of course, the, the, the producers, you know, the factories, but also every one of us, you know, uh, need, to, uh, need to be held accountable as well, need to behave uh, responsibly as well. And um, to us, obviously, you know, the, in, in terms of factories, you, you have the legal standards for their discharge. So you can, we can weigh in quite easily, saying that you break the law, right? You offended the interest of, uh, of others, and then you're wrong. But when it comes to, uh, to our citizens, uh, and that's a different story. There's no clear law, uh, you know, in most cases. And banning for overconsumption or whatever. And uh, uh, well, no, and we have a solution here in the economics department. Okay, uh, it's that uh, energy prices should reflect the pollution damages and the CO two damages. Yeah, that's uh, that's part of it. And uh, uh, I think by uh, we don't think anything else is necessary. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, everything if everything works so beautifully. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Like the economists want to see, then where we'll, I think we, the world will be in a better a better place. That's, right? You know, you could come here any time of day. Someone's saying that in this uh, building. Right, right. It's just simply not that easy. But uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we all know that. Yes. Uh, but but there, you know, back home, you know, when we try to do something to uh, to at least to help. Uh, get rid of some of uh, some of the very obvious externalities uh, i think it will help uh, to at least internalize some of the hidden cost back in the in the cost of those uh, uh products you know i'm really struck by you know increasingly when i uh have chance to to come to this part of the world i can see that you know some of the the so-called fast fashion industry you know i really got you know you you wear something and then you just wear that once and you can throw that away. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, back home when you see the, those discharge from the dye houses, you, you, you know that uh, it's not right uh, because uh, uh, those costs have not been factored in uh, into that, uh, uh, you know, into those boutique stores or uh, department stores. So. Uh, so I think you know we need to do something at least uh, you know following the economic rules uh, that you you internalize the cost right uh, you know I think that part uh, uh, it's something it, we we can do you know our pro our program is um, uh, you know fundamentally awareness building is also important and uh, our program is called uh, the Green Choice Initiative because we under we can't dominate we can't tell others how to live their life, but we can give them a choice. You know, in China, we, we have the young generation, uh, not like us, uh, they grow up uh, learning a lot of the environmental uh, knowledge, a lot more than us, but they also uh, grow up in a year of, uh, of you know, abundant supply, and uh, so they, not like us, try, uh, very conserve a lot of things, and uh, we need to give, Many of them still have their American dream. You know, they want everything bigger. You know, and bigger and bigger. Drive bigger cars, <coughs> bigger house, bigger burger, and all the, all of this. And uh, similar like here. And but if we can give them a a, a better sense of the uh, choice, uh, to know the consequences, uh, you choose this way uh, of doing things, then. You know, you, you or your family, your children will be exposed to something that you de absolutely not won't be very happy with. So I think you know how to connect that dot is uh, is a challenge. Uh, we all have to learn more uh, how to engage, how to visualize everything. And uh, with that, you know, I'm particularly happy to have a chance to work with Linda and her team, NRDC team. Uh, to uh, try to create the first uh, uh, we call the brand accountability map. Uh, some of the brands have gone to such a level that they decided that it's time for them to link their logo, put their logo on the factories, uh, uh, on their suppliers uh, in China. 
you know, uh, basically uh, we are going to launch that in a couple of months of time. You can click through that and get a sense about their enforcement, you know, their, their performance records, and sometimes real-time monitoring data. You can actually see in your own eyes. We hope that uh, this will help to uh, close this uh, divide. You know, we, in China, back in China, sometimes I got chance, you know, in my investigation, I got those local communities in some, some of the cases, even kneeling down in front of me, you know, saying that uh, they need help. And uh, what can we do? We don't have that much resources or power, but we can only assure them that we, we're going to try to have their voice being heard. Uh, the voice that lost in this, in this complex, uh, globalized uh, layers upon layers of, uh, of supply chain. And uh, uh, we can reconnect the dots through this uh, uh, new digital technology. And, uh, uh, and I think, you know, with that, it's just like in the old days, we have the factories nearby, and uh, if they really pollute and destroy our, our, uh, our health and of the communities, uh, people realize that. But now, you know, across the Pacific, you, you won't see that. But now, you know, with, uh, with the IT technology, with the expansion of transparency in countries, even including like China, such a vast expansion, progress made in transparency, that has finally been made possible. And now we, go, we are not going to stop there. My colleagues, you know, we have been reached out by our neighboring regions, worrying that the migration of, uh, of supply chain to their countries will lead to a migration of pollution to Vietnam, to Cambodia, to India, right? Uh, Bangladesh. So I'm so encouraged by the, by the program, Michael, you, you are doing and, and, and in India. I think there's a, I hope there's a chance for us to really work together uh, to, you know, really try to uh, create a more leveled playing field uh, and to bring this global trade investment and manufacturing. It's been an incredible pleasure to have you here. I, we've been, uh, for two years, we were hoping that you would say yes. Uh, <laughs> and it's just been terrific to have you here. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.